morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining me on this beautiful day. I'm Laurie Cadigan. I am the uh, CEO and owner of Barrett Sotheby's International Realty with eight office locations ranging from Westford to Winchester. Um, we have offices in Bedford and Lincoln and Carlisle and Lexington and Concord and Acton and Bedford and I think I've got them all. <laughs> We've been in, in business for uh, over 40 years independently owned and operated. We are a uh, part of the Sotheby's International Realty um, Associates. And I'm here today to share my story. Um, my husband and I raised our family in Concord 32 years there. Um, we were originally from the city and came out to uh, beautiful Concord, Massachusetts to raise our family. Um, and frankly, um, we're very, very happy there for many years until the nest started to empty. Um, and, you know, we looked around at, uh, at our beautiful home um, several years ago and decided that it was John and I and the Golden Retriever. And, um, you know, it was kind of foolish to, to rattle around in spaces that we really had never, you know, had not been using for a while. So I'm going to share my screen because I've got some great stuff to share with you. Um, Hopefully you can all see that. Getting ready to downsize is um, the topic. Hopefully you're on the right Zoom call. And um, we're gonna talk about downsizing. As I mentioned, you know, there are rooms in your home that you probably haven't used in over a year, except to go in once in a while and dust. Um, there's areas where you cannot find your belongings. There's Americans spend an average of 55 minutes a day looking for things they can't find in their own home. So, you know, George Collin years ago used to talk about the stuff and you look around your home and you realize it's an, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and sometimes it's very, very overwhelming to think about how you're gonna make a transition to your next phase of life. Um, but I'm gonna give you some tips and uh, Marie LeBlanc from uh, Transition Liquidation has joined me as well. She's an extraordinaire at getting rid of the stuff. Um, so bear with us. If you've got questions, you can put them in the chat or you can wait until the end. Marie and I are happy to hang around and, and answer any questions that you have. Um, the things that you need to think about when you're thinking about the next phase is, you know, what will you want to continue? I did, this was not my craft room, but I did have a craft room. I had sewing machines and fabrics and wrapping papers and and obviously, you know, the time had come for me to separate from, from some of those areas. You just can't take it all. Um, my husband um, had accumulated, thanks to uh, his dad and my dad, 12 hammers, 17 screwdriver. I mean, you just, you have to decide what's, what's the next plan. Um, is it golf? You know, are you going to continue playing golf? Um, do you need a woodworking shop? Is a garage important? Um, so those are the things that you're going to start to think about. What will you want to continue and what are you ready to kind of leave behind? Um, ready to research is an area where we as realtors are expert at. People need to kick the tires. Um, friends and family will give you advice. Maybe you want to live near friends and family. Um, obviously, lots of people on websites these days, realtor.com, Zillow, et cetera. Um, I caution you on some of those sites because by the time you fall in love with a, with a property, many times the property is already under agreement. We've got a very, very robust market right now, but it, that's a great way to start doing research. Our um, company has a great email system where if you give us the criteria that you're looking for and the general area that you'd like to live in, Arlington, Cambridge, New Hampshire, Florida, um, we can send you email updates as soon as those properties that match your criteria come on. I'm happy to take um, your email address and, and register you for any of those programs. Open houses are, are, are a great way. Well, open houses are back. You know, during the pandemic, we really weren't doing very many of them. We're obviously doing them now. And um, it's, you know, it's a good way to start to do some of that research. So most people start in their fuzzy slippers at home. <coughs> Excuse me. and um, poke around on those websites. And then once you start to get serious, it's a good thing to kind of reach out to a professional and, and try to get a little more detail on, on exactly what's available in the area that you're looking at. 
Um, do you need to sell before you buy? Will you buy first? A lot of people will not be comfortable selling before they know that where they're going to end up, you know, the um, the next move. So that's become very very difficult with the inventory shortage because, as we know, there's not a lot of available inventory. So you really need to to kind of you know hone in on the territories, the areas, the criteria for the for the property. Um, arranging closing dates is um, sometimes a tricky thing. My husband and I um, were really not quite ready to move yet. You know, we just started the, the, the search and we got closer and closer and closer to Boston. Um, and frankly, what happened was we walked into an open house and fell in love. At least I did. And uh, what we decided was we were going to put in an offer on a property in, in Boston, a condominium. And we had about 30 days to get our own property ready. We could not afford to own both of the properties at the same time. So we were trying to stagger those closing dates. Um, it took us a little bit of time to get our, our, um, our property ready. Once we did, ironically, we found a buyer who also had a timeline that wasn't perfect for us. So my family ended up selling our home in Concord early. We all moved in with friends for, for a couple of weeks and then closed on our condominium and in Boston. So, you know, a professional will help you figure out what's the timing, how do you manage that domino of, uh, of uh, property purchases. Um, and you know, we're, we're really um, very, very happy to do help, help with that. Um, where to put the items that you want to keep, you know, in, in a lot of instances, we as real estate professionals will come in and ask you to kind of weed out some of the stuff that, that either you're not going to take or that a family member is going to take but they're going to be things that you want to take along that we may indeed tell you that, you know, might be good to, to minimize some of the furniture and belongings in your room, in your, uh, in your rooms at home. It's a, we have lots of temporary storage. Um, a lot of our moving companies will allow you to store some of those items for a given period of time, as long as your final move is done with them. So they you know, there's a lot of uh, temporary storage areas for that. Temporary housing is another area. Um, you know, if you don't exactly know where you're going or you haven't found something that you want to move to, but you still want to make sure that you sell first, get your money in the bank so that when you're ready and you found your perfect property, you're ready to move. Um, there are lots of areas in our, there are lots of housing in our area that move, house temporary housing. Um, Katahdin Woods in Lexington, there's some areas in Burlington. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, available um, places to kind of stage your next phase. The financial picture is always um, one that people question, you know, how will you fund the pur purchase? Is all of the money coming from the equity in your home? Um, many times taking an equity loan will at least give you the down payment on the property that you're going to be moving to. Um, perhaps you don't need uh, the money to, to, uh, from your home to, to uh, purchase your next home. So those are the questions. Uh, today's requirements on mortgage financing is an area that we have a lot of discussion about and we have a lot of professionals that we're very, very comfortable with that assist people in those moves all the time and we're happy to share those vendors with you. There's a lot of great mortgage financing um, people in the, in the business now. Um, the biggest issue with moving is decluttering. I'm embarrassed to say that this was indeed my husband's office. Um, you know, he was in it for many years, very comfortable. We started to sort of pack up. Um, it's a it's a tempting thing to say that you you know you start with one room at a time. Um, it can be a little overwhelming, and Marie's going to chat a little bit about that. Um, but you really need to declutter. Um, decluttering over and over again. Uh, there are a lot of areas where um, Marie will discuss. What do you do with the books? Where do you put the uh, you know the extra furniture? Um, this was my home, my uh, kitchen um, area uh, in our our home in in Concord. You can see that it's incredibly customized. Obviously, it's during the holiday period, but I've got custom wallpaper, custom draperies, brass hardware, uh, you know, French, very French provincial kind of plan. Um, it was wonderful when we moved in. And unfortunately, what, what uh, today's consumer is looking for is editing out. You know, there's, it's just too overwhelming for them to be able to visualize their belongings in that home. So um, we repurposed some, some furniture, obviously took the wallpaper off the walls, um, painted them a very neutral color. Same thing with the, uh, the, the uh, drapery panels. That uh, um, 
buffet on the right was actually a piece of a, a bureau in my son's room that had too much furniture, so we repurposed that. Um, I actually rented a couple of those chairs. You don't need to do a whole lot. I mean, obviously, I was the owner of a real estate company, so I'm, you know, all eyes were on me. But we are we uh, try very hard to to minimize the investment in your current home because we really want you to be saving money for your next move. But you know, you'd be amazed what a can, a can of paint could will provide. These are minor changes that we typically uh, recommend. This the top picture here, you know, is a lovely red wall, um, very busy rug. Uh, you know, it it, uh, it just was very customized. You're looking similar to the HGTV uh, TV shows that you see. You're looking to neutralize as much as possible. So we did indeed ask the homeowner to paint that red wall. Um, this is the same sectional, and we really just swapped out the um, we just swapped out the rug. Um, you get, can get very, very um, uh, overwhelmed with the details. You know, I happen to have brass hardware in the, in the home. My husband spent a weekend swapping out the, the hardware, which at the time was, you know, the trend was oil rub bronze. Um, you don't need to do all that much work related to, you know, making your home presentable. Um, the funny story I used to tell my, my family, I gave everybody a stack of bins and what we said to our three children was, if you can, whatever you can fit in the bins, we will pay to store. Um, anything that doesn't fit in the bins, you're going to pay to store. And miraculously, they just fin just filled the bins that uh, that we had provided them. So you know, everybody had to dig in and and make sure that they could uh, minimize and move things along. How many hockey trophies would you would you like to keep? You know, um, artwork from your kindergarten areas. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a um, it's a lot to kind of walk through that, but it can be done. And then there are the clothes. You know, I happen to have several different sizes. I bounce around a little bit. Um, you know, wh what do you do with the clothes? Marie will chat about the uh, the ability to um, sell clothing or donate clothing. Um, you know, it's 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 a big issue. Um, this was my golden retriever. We did an awful lot of painting and fixing um, because we had been in the house for 15 years and. You know, between hockey players and children and all that, we you know we had to spiff up the plan. We have a program um, called Steps to Soul that will start with a preview of your of your home. One of the things we we want to caution people about is there are times when homeowners jump in and decide, oh, I'm, I need granite counters, or I'm going to need to update my bathroom, or I need to finish my basement. Most of the time, it's really just decluttering and editing out, um, you know, very heavily customized items. Um, you really should not be spending a, a whole lot of money on, um, on, you know, adding additional value, basically, because it's, uh, it's probably not going to be a, you know, good re um, return on your investment. Our refresh, renovate and stage program um, is there, in, uh, we call it our wake love program to forget an experience, to, to, to create an unforgettable experience for prospective buyers. You want them to come in and be able to visualize their belongings in that space. It definitely elevates your home's value um, and you'll, you're going to experience the highest potential with the highest rate of return. Once again, we bring in um, you know, lots of folks that are expert at staging, um, will assist in helping you decide you know, which colors, which, what uh, you know? What should be uh, improved, and and really what you shouldn't be spending money on. Um, the great thing about the program is that um, you can um, uh, take the um, the uh, the uh, money from the white glove um, service and improve your property. Once your property sells, which will inevitably be you know, for a higher value than, than before you're, you're staging and renovating, um, the, you can pay for that out of pocket at, at closing. So there's no out of pocket um, upfront money. You don't have to take an equity loan. Um, we manage the vendors that between the uh, landscapers, you can even, if you're, if you're concerned about your septic system, they will even front the money for a septic system. Um, so all of that can be done as you're getting ready to, um, to uh, get your home on the market, once it's on the market and closed, then those proceeds get paid back to that, to that white glove service. So it's, it's, it's become a very, very um, popular service. It's a concierge plan um, and Barrett Sotheby's International Realty is, is exclusive to, uh, to this white glove program. So I'm happy to answer questions about that um, 
after the plan. But for, in the meantime, I'd love to just give you um, the getting Cinderella ready for the ball. Um, the way to uh, position this situation is to make sure that you start that decluttering and sorting out um, a program as early as possible. And so I'm gonna have Marie take it from here. Marie, I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and you can share yours. Um, There you go. There you go. All right. Unmute. Okay. I'm in. Um, thank you, Lori, and thank you to everyone who's attending. I appreciate your time. Um, Lori and I actually first started doing these a number of years ago when we both started. We both had done our own uh, right sizing. We both had gone from large homes to small condos or whatever. So when we present, we talk about it as being something that we're presenting tips, both from a practitioner, you know, being the people who actually have to implement and do this and why we're doing it. And also from somebody who survived the process. And I will tell you that it actually is a process that you can survive. <laughs> that much we know. Okay. okay. All right. So when I talk to folks, um, the biggest thing that we talk about is it's a math problem. Most people have lived in their homes 30, 40, 50. I've been in presentations or met with folks who have even been there for 60 or 70 years. And all of the stuff you're accumulating during that time frame is done over a very long period of time. And the idea that you're going to be able to just sit there, look at everything in a few months and get it all processed just doesn't make sense. So if in fact you have the opportunity, because um, oftentimes people will say, well, I don't really know where I'm going right now or um, haven't completely settled on a place. The issue is it's more than likely going to be smaller. If we're living in 2,500, 3,000 square feet, most of the condos that you're looking at are between 1,000 or you know houses uh, or apartments in communities, you're looking at 1,000, 1,500. So you know you got to get down to half. And oftentimes, uh, it's concentrating on those rooms that you do live in, as Lori mentioned, you know, it's a bedroom, it's a bathroom, it's a place where you watch TV, it's a place where you use the computer and pay bills, and it's a kitchen. And so uh, concentrating on that and knowing that what you're taking from those places is what you really want is incredibly important. Um, but then there's all those tuckaways, and that's usually where the problem comes in. So the tuckaways are sellers, addicts closets, especially in bedrooms that you don't use on a regular basis. It's, you know, the cabinets in the kitchen that are way up above the refrigerator and the shelves that are too high for anybody to reach or too low for anybody to get to. And you've got things stuffed in there for years that you're really not using and um, can be sort of a, a quick pick, if you will. So when we talk about how to make sure that this process is successful, and by successful, our definition is that you end up taking the items that you want, um, even if it's not all the items you want, but the bulk of the items that you want, um, the items you don't want, um, hopefully we will find a new home for, whether that's selling or donating them. As a last resort, there does always need to be some amount of disposal, but that Basically, a success is that you, you may be sad a little bit, but once you get used to the idea of your new space, it ends up being as much home as the old space was, and you're living there very comfortably. So to that end, we always tell folks, start with a floor plan. Um, and we do a scaled floor plan because we don't want you to overstuff things. We don't want you to take things that you think are going to fit and then turn out that they don't. It's not a very good way to start when you get to your new home, thinking that I've already given up a lot, now I've got to give up more. Um, again, we're looking at the spaces where you're really going to live, bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, living room, den, TV area. 
Um, when we work with folks or when we do schedules for folks to do work on their own, we normally tell them that two to three hours is about all they can handle. Uh, we tend to find that folks just start to burn out after about two or three hours. So if you're a morning person, nine to 12, afternoon person, one to four, set the timer, don't take phone calls, uh, don't get distracted, really concentrate. And then do one, two, maybe three sessions a week, depending on how far out you are to your move. And that will make a considerable dent. The other big thing um, is to not sort of scatter around the house. So decide what is going to be maybe easier for you to deal with. For some folks, it's going through some old clothing and the worst things for them to do are letters, papers, and photographs. Uh, each person's a little bit different. Um, some people would rather rip the Band-Aid off and start with those first. Other people need a little bit of success behind them. So they start in areas that don't matter so much. Um, but if you go from room to room and you just start to scatter, your house is going to eventually look like a bomb went off, which is what you don't want to have happen because then that looks even worse to tackle than it did before. So really concentrate on it. Um, and see, can I get through a closet in three hours? And if that's the case, then just do that one closet. Don't get aggressive, you know, save the time, do the next closet the next time. Um, the other big thing is that uh, folks usually get overwhelmed at feeling that they have to make a decision about every single thing in their house. So the Tupperware, um, you know, the perhaps the, the towels that have seen better days. Um, usually it's that they want to make sure that something that still has use finds its way to a place or someone that can use it. The issue that we have is again, a timing one and an energy one. Um, and so what we tend to find is that folks spend a lot of time loading up their car, driving from donation place to donation place and dropping things off. What that doesn't do is leave them a lot of time and energy to actually make the decisions about what they want to take. So we tend to tell folks, just concentrate. Do I want this? Do I not? If it goes into the not pile, we can take care of figuring out where's the best place for it to go. Um, and actually physically getting it there, getting you donation receipts, or if it gets sold, getting you some cash for that. Um, but running around ragged is not helping the situation, okay? Um, and as Lori said, you know, we love to tell folks to move first and sell your house after, if that's at all possible. There's nothing worse than having to go through this edit process and living in a house that you don't feel really is your home anymore. And, you know, having to step out for showings and all of that, it's, it's very disruptive. So if we can get you safely settled into your new place and then put your house on the market, that's always a much easier proposition. So um, one of the first things people will say to me is, how do I sell my stuff? What's worth money? You know, what's popular right now? What's not? So in general, there are a few factors that are definitely taking um, a toll since I first started 20 years ago to now on what the current market prices for stuff is and, you know, who's buying it. So if we think about the current situation, a lot of it is, completely opposite to the housing market, there's a glut of supply and not a lot of demand. And part of that, if you think about it, is just the fact that we're all living much longer. I'm 63, my dad's 85. You know, I've already done my downsizing. When he goes, I'm not gonna want really a lot of his stuff, which is very different than when our parents were passing in their 60s and we were 40, and we had an opportunity to take on other people's lovely things and actually incorporate them. The other big thing is uh, because of that, then who actually are going to be the buyers for the things that we're trying to resell. And what we're finding is that they are people in their twenties and thirties. And so what is it that they want? What do they value? And I have to be very honest, unfortunately they view furnishings 
as decorations, not as investments. So, you know, that beautiful mahogany double pedestal Duncan Fife dining room table that you have with the matching, you know, eight or 10 chairs, the sideboard, the china cabinet. No, 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 and no. Um, you can take a look at, you know, Ballard Designs or, you know, interior, Boston Interiors or any of those beautiful home uh, magazines that you may get and see that what they're being marketed is very plain, very simple, no flowers, no patterns, no, no nothing, um, no skirts, no tufting. It, it's a very different kind of look. And in their mind, since it is decoration, if it only lasts for five or 10 years, that's okay. Because in five or 10 years, they throw it all out and they start all over again and they have a beautiful new thing that looks like the magazine again. So that has a huge effect on what actually people are looking for. The other and probably biggest thing is the whole way that eBay and the web have affected the pricing of things. So I remember when I first started, one of my first customers loved to collect chocolate pots, which were these very beautiful hand-painted porcelain, kind of looked like a coffee pot, perhaps a little taller. Um, she had 400 and she had a huge display area and she would methodically swap them out every so often and put different ones on display. She could tell me the story pretty much of every single one that she had. She could tell me where she bought it, um, when she bought it, how much she paid for it. And what she would do is she would start out on a Saturday morning and she would get in the car and go up route one all the way to Maine to all these beautiful antique stores. And she would go hunting and she loved the hunt. She loved driving. She loved seeing all the sites. She loved meeting the people who own the stores and the other people who shopped in the stores. And then when she would see one that she didn't have and hadn't seen before, and it was marked four, five, six hundred dollars or more, she was perfectly willing to pay that because it was rare, it was beautiful, and it was hard work to get. Now, you could probably wake up two o'clock in the morning, can't sleep, get yourself a cup of tea, sit in front of your computer in your jammies. And literally with three clicks, that same product can be at your doorstep two or three days later. And so <clears throat> not only are you looking at something that obviously is not rare or special because maybe there's a half dozen of them for sale, but it also didn't take any work. And so as humans, we're sort of programmed to think that the harder something is for us to do, the more worthwhile it is and therefore the more worth it is. And so that's not even part of the equation anymore. So that definitely has had a huge effect on how much something is worth. In terms of COVID-19, we're still, you know, I'd love to tell you that we're not under COVID-19 anymore, but trust me, there's a huge number of uh, factors that are still at play. Um, Certainly in terms of, again, adding to the glut of supply, everyone has been stuck at home and everyone had the same brilliant idea that, oh my God, look at all this stuff. I got to get rid of some of this stuff. And so they all started cleaning out. And that means that the actual items that are available have gone up in quantity in a huge amount. And at the same time, a lot of the donation centers, the antique stores, the con consignment shops, they were closed for months. And even when they opened, if you think about the people who work there, they tend to be older folks. So their staffing levels were much lower. They were reducing the number of hours they were open. Lots of times they were only taking in consignments or even selling things on an appointment basis. And even now that effect still lingers. In terms of the wholesale buyers and the dealers, they're still somewhat reluctant to take on a lot of inventory and pay high dollars for it and then be uh, solely at risk, frankly, for what they've spent and being able to turn it. There's still sort of this uneasiness that something might happen and the stores might close again or whatever. Um, 
at the same time, the transportation crisis, which people tend not to think that it has anything to do with us because, you know, the news shows pictures of these ships stuck out in, in the Pacific. And so everyone thinks well, that's got nothing to do with us. But the transportation crisis actually is all the way down to and including every truck driver, every van driver, whoever does for movers, Amazon, uh, any of the delivery stuff, even in this area. And so all of the new stuff that people are trying to get in has definitely been shrunk in availability and it's actually had somewhat of a positive effect on the resale demand because people are saying, okay, I maybe can't buy the couch of my dreams right now, but there's this couch in this resale shop and it's, you know, $800 and for $800, I can live with it to, you know, get something that I need and, and basically service me for the interim. And then the other huge part is the number of in schedules for the auctions have increased However, so hasn't the staff. And so, and unfortunately the people to staff the auctions, put all the pictures up, do all the write-ups and all that stuff has decreased. So it's um, a lot more auctions, but I've seen folks, uh, I have a client that submitted items to auction in April and we're probably gonna be lucky if they make it into auctions in November. So the schedules are definitely pushed out there. In terms of the overall sales things, um, you know, one of the services that we're finding as time has gone on that our clients are taking advantage of the most is this idea of help me through this maze. What's the best way to sell my stuff? Because each one of these channels has positives, negatives, it has characteristics that you need to take into account. So for instance, uh, you know, the estate sales now, um, the commission has risen to 35, 40% uh, to run them. And the minimum has risen to about $10,000. So if you don't have a $10,000 gross sale minimum, we need to look at other ways to sell your things. Um, we talked a little bit about the auctions, the extended period for payment, um, and you know how they would sell them. Dealers, wholesalers, you know, they're still coming. The shops, some of the shops have closed. So when you think about it, there's fewer options. Um, consignment stores are still definitely out there. Um, but again, they have their own little things. Uh, for instance, consignment stores, you as the seller have to get the item to the store, which means there's a cost to you. Um, how much that cost is depends on, of course, what it is. Um, and then they're going to keep it for a couple months. They're going to start at a certain sale price. It's going to go down. If you're talking uh, clothing, those they'll only take in limited bundles. So you might be able to submit 20 or 30 items at a time and they have to be in season. So right now, if you were to get an appointment at a consignment clothing store, you could maybe bring in 20 or 30 fall items. And then in another few weeks, it's going to go to winter. So Again, if you're thinking of doing this and rolling it out over time, you've got some time to be able to do, you know, one of these appointments a season and bring things, but it takes some planning. Um, and the other big thing, of course, driving prices is the whole eBay, Craigslist, social media. Um, we found that overall, I think if you have things you want to give away for free, a lot of the social media stuff is a great way to do it. You know, next door, Harvard, Concord, whatever town, um, you know, put it out on the curb. Somebody comes, picks it up. It's fairly safe. It's, you know, they're not in your home. You're not, you're not having strangers in your home. Um, but to actually sell things for a lot of money, we're not finding people having as much luck that way. Um, you get a lot of tire kickers, not as many, of the um, folks who are serious, serious buyers. So my huge, huge advice is purge early, purge often. So when we come to people, um, our average, I would say, is, you know, in a four bedroom, two and a half bath, cellar, attic, garage, maybe shed out back, we normally have to dispose of somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two 30 yard dumpsters. 
And when those things show up, they're big and people will look at them and say, oh my God, like there's no way I could fill that. And trust me, we do. And when I think about how people can actually do themselves a favor and save money in this process, one of the ways is to discipline yourself to put out one extra bag of trash every single week. If you do that, by the end of a year, you will have filled about an equivalent to one 30 yard dumpster. If we have to come and do a concerted effort between the labor costs, the disposal fees, dropping off the dumpster, picking up the dumpster, all of that, you're looking at a cost somewhere in the neighborhood because it's gone up of about $1,500 to $2,000. So you can save yourself some considerable money just doing some little steps over time. The other, again, huge thing is we talked about the donations. Uh, our preferred vendors uh, for donations are Household Goods Recycling in Acton, um, and also more than words for books in Waltham. Uh, we also do a lot of stuff with savers. There's a number of uh, saver locations in West Roxbury and Natick. Um, again, they're not doing a lot of pickups, don't have a lot of drivers, um, but they will take the donations limited time period. Uh, so we actually do such a volume that we have a pod on our hauler site for each of those different organizations and we fill those pods and they call them and then they come and pick them up. So we don't, we're not tied to worrying about, you know, the limited hours for being able to be on site. Um, and certainly if you're going to look at doing a donation and you do get somebody to come out and do a pickup, really do it in advance of your closing date. Uh, we often will get calls from folks who unfortunately pressed it to the last minute and are looking to have a donation pick up a day or two before closing. And then the donation folks get there and for whatever reason, they don't take everything. And now you're stuck with stuff that you need to scramble to take care of. So we definitely, uh, give folks the advice of doing something well in advance of your actual closing date. And the other huge one is if your town does a hazardous material day, please take advantage of that. Um, because of the trash and situation with China and a number of other um, organizations where you, we used to be able to as a country send hazardous material and large volume trash that doesn't exist anymore. Um, we're looking at hazardous material charges rising to $10 for each thing. So every spray can, every uh, can of paint, everything of oil, every little container of oil, um, mattresses at $25, box springs at $25, dehumidifiers at $25. So you start to look at some of the hazmat that you have that you're definitely not using and just never got rid of. And we oftentimes are finding folks with hazmat charges in the neighborhood of $500 to $1,000 easily. So if you can take advantage of something where you can bring um, you know, old electronics for recycling and hazmat and that sort of thing to your town or to a town nearby, then that's a perfect way to save yourself some money. So what's next? And I always say, you know, just start, like just start, see what happens when you start. Um, until you start, you're probably not going to know what makes you feel okay, what makes you very upset and sad. And um, so give yourself the luxury of time to start processing. And also, you know, understand that it's a bit of an iterative process. You can think that you've decluttered a lot and yet there's still a lot there. Um, so it may be something where you have to take a few multiple passes in order to really get to the goal. So those are, those are my tips. Uh, certainly, if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. I often say that, you know, when I, uh, when we decided to move, I really expected my children to walk through the house and want lots of my great stuff. They really didn't. <laughs> my daughter, because bar carts are a thing now, she, I think she took a couple of carafts and that was about it. You know, no furniture, different style, as Marie said, that, you know, they're shopping at uh, Ikea 
and not looking for the Ethan Allen pieces that we cherished from you know yesteryear. Um, so Maria is, is an expert at getting you started, what to do with the stuff, where to put the stuff, how to do that floor plan, all of that is a, is a great element. Um, we are happy at Barrett Sotheby's to have you, we're, we're happy to walk through your home, give you some ideas of what you could do very simply to improve the property and um, increase your, your sale price and market time, frankly. Um, so we're happy to, uh, if you wanna put your, your name or what have you in the chat, um, we're happy to have someone give a call and, and walk you through or just step into any one of our offices. Um, to give you a hand, we you know we're, we're, uh, we pride ourselves on making this process as seamless as possible. Any questions? I, I'm happy to have you unmute yourself. I'll put them in the chat. A couple of my realtors on the call. Carol, good to see you, and Cheryl. Um, so there was a question in the chat about solutions for mattresses and box springs that are in good condition. And actually household goods recycling will take those. They do have a relationship with a number of homeless shelters. Uh, and so the, really the biggest thing is uh, no stains, no tears. And- uh, The homes will be recycled. Oh, I don't know what that was. Okay, any other questions? Well, I hope you found this helpful. What about antiques? Antiques. <laughs> so the infamous antiques. Um, so let me just say that, um, again, thinking about the people who are uh, seriously purchasing uh, in the resale market, um, anything large and bulky, so china cabinets, um, you know, large secretaries, that kind of thing, um, those really are not selling, unfortunately. And then um, sterling is definitely still selling, but unfortunately uh, will likely be scrapped um, for the silver value. Same thing with jewelry. Um, in terms of other furniture, um, again, those Duncan Fife double pedestal dining room tables are probably gonna be donation. Um, art can sometimes still be for sale. It just depends on the actual market for the person. Um, and then uh, what else? What other kinds of antique things? Um, yeah, I would say probably the smaller items. China's not really still selling uh, crystal. Um, I mean, unfortunately, you know, Waterford is selling at BJ's for $10 a stem. So, um, as they mass marketed, everything sort of fell through the floor. Hummels and Yadro and all the collections that my mother had. They unfortunately, our, uh, our next generation is not collecting those items. So it's, it's been a challenge. No. Um, and King I did see, sorry, the king size. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and what you, you know, they're wicked expensive. It's just like rugs. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, the larger rugs that you buy, they'll cost you an, an incredible premium, but then when you go to sell them, they're not worth anything because not too many people can buy big rugs. Um, so it's kind of, you're, you're caught in a quandary, but, um, unfortunately, uh, again, if you're thinking about who's going to take the mattresses, um, it's going to be homeless shelters and things where you're looking at, you know, twin size sleeping situations, not king size. So, you know, twins, fulls, you start to get to queens and kings and it's not as much. Um, usually the box springs though for king size mattresses are actually split twins. So those they'll sometimes take still. Um, we have, we do have um, people who, as opposed to donating and dropping, um, that will that will take trash. Um, and it's unfortunate that you'll end up paying for that, but there are people that will take that, those king size mattresses as, um, as trash. And I feel terrible about the fact that they can't even, they won't take your sleep number beds because I have to tell you, my husband is thrilled with his. Um, so I, I, I don't want, I, 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 it looks like they won't take those either. That's unfortunate. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you know, the question about good China is unfortunate. Uh, we've all got good China. They, if you, if, you know, many times it won't go into a dishwasher. 
Um, so, you know, the, the new generation is, is usually not looking for um, those patterns that, you know, the, uh, the gentle, fragile China pieces. Um, Marie, would you say? China's yeah, no, unfortunately, what I do, what I'll tell my clients is the same thing that we did, which is, you know, when I decided to do my downsize and I looked at the China, the good China I had, I said, you know, what am I saving it for? Um, and I just started using it for every day. And I figured, you know what, if it doesn't make it, it doesn't matter. I enjoyed it. I loved it. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, question is someone from Barrett to advise us on what needs to be repaired or changed in our house before it goes on the market? Absolutely. Um, Bev Miller, if you would, um, I'm going to give you my email address. It's L Cadigan. John, maybe you can put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. L Cadigan at Barrett, SIR.com. If you just uh, email me, we'll have someone in one of our, from our, you know, an area wherever you live, um, happy to walk through. And I will say this again, we can save you a lot of money. Um, people tend to feel like they know what they, they want to do um, because they've watched it on Chip and Joanna Gaines. You do not need to do the renovations that, uh, that you see on HGTV to get your house sold. So, you know, we're, our job is to minimize all of that. Good to see you. Anybody else quickly? Hopefully this has been helpful. Oh, I do have one question if you have time. Of course. Um, how about guard, things like um, lawnmowers, snow blowers, stuff like that? Most of the time, your next buyer may be interested in those. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people transfer. Most of the, of, of the buyers that are coming out of the city, you know, they're coming from condos. They're, this is their first home or depending on, you know, what they've, what they've been used to. So a lot of times we can take those garden um, equipment, rakes, et cetera, um, and see if the, the new buyer is interested in them. Otherwise, it's the same situation. You're going to be on a, uh, you know, a, a, uh, an area where you're putting it up on Facebook Marketplace or one of the social media sites to try to, to get rid of those. Thank you. You're welcome. The other thing that the other thing that we've been encouraging uh, with some of that type of equipment things and um, and things like rugs is trade-ins. So we've uh, sometimes had some luck with some of the better, you know, not the kind of stuff that you might buy at Sears, but maybe some of the better equipment that you might've gotten John Deere's or, you know, some of that sort of thing. If you still have children or grandchildren and you no longer need, you know, a riding mower and, you know, that da 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 and maybe they don't want necessarily the same exact things you have, but they could use a new snowblower or they could do something. Um, we're finding that again in this marketplace, because the shortages are there, that some of the places will take equipment in for credit or for trade in, as long as what you're buying is more expensive than what you're trading in. Um, and we're finding oh, yeah. the same with rugs, you know, um, oftentimes the rugs are really not worth on their own much more than a hundred, 200, $300, which is, you know, really sad. People usually have paid a lot more than that. Um, but sometimes you can go to a Gregorian's or a Dover rug and actually, uh, trade in for something for a new, you know, something new that you might like. Um, and that's a good way to sort of recycle it, if you will. You just got to chip away at it. Unfortunately, you know, as we say, purge often, start now, have us yeah. walk through, give you some ideas. Don't want to be last minute. Um, you know, John and I, as I said, we fell in love with a condo, had to scramble to get a bathroom painted and, you know, tools donated. And you really want to try to get ahead of that so that you're not in that position. Um, and you, you take the time and, and try to go through your items and, and do some updating. And we find too with the uh, communities, oftentimes if you are in a waiting list, it does end up being somewhat opportunistic. You know, um, it, it's unfortunately a bit of a, 
you know, a, a domino effect, but, um, you know, they could tell you, oh, it's going to be a year, two years. And then all of a sudden this perfect thing comes oh, yeah. and then boom, there you are, you know, and, and you want to be in a position to be able to take advantage of something opportunistic like that, because it doesn't happen all the time. So, you know, again, the better prepared you are, it's always uh, more helpful. Well, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Marie, thank you. It's like, I think this is our seventh year. I, when I was looking. At least, at least, yeah. <laughs> um, we're very, very, uh, you know, once you've lived through it, you look back and say, oh my goodness, I should have done this years ago. You know, as we say in the real estate business, once your head hits the pillow, you'll forget all about the, the, uh, the trauma that you had to go through getting through those photographs in China and all that. But there's plenty of help. I think our, our position here, and ha which is, has been for the past you know, several years where we've been doing this session, don't do this alone. There are lots of vendors, Marie, donation areas. We, you know, we're happy to kind of give you that kickstart and, um, and the inspiration, um, which, which would be great. Uh, appreciate your practical advice. I hope we are been inspirational. Yes. And, and the, you know, the, the parent thing is also, you know, because again, just like our kids don't want any of our stuff, we're sitting there looking at our parents' stuff and trying very hard for it to not be somewhat disrespectful that, you know, oh, my parents accumulated this stuff and, you know, they love this stuff and it's been over a whole lifetime. And now I'm just going to throw it in a box and give it away. Um, I mean, I can tell you my own story when my mother passed away, which is around the time when I started this business about 20 years ago. And she had this transferware China that she just loved. She bought it at the grocery store. I think probably a lot of us can remember, you know, you save the stamps or you go in oh and my spend so much. And she was so proud of this thing and she would use it all the time. Every family gathering, she would take it out of the, you know, the little cabinet she had it in. And, um, you know, she, she went very quickly, but one of the things that she said to me was that, you know, I want you to have that China and cause you're gonna start doing all the family holidays now. And so it'll be there. And I just, I'm sorry, but I did not like this stuff. Like didn't like it at all. And it wasn't something you could put in the dishwasher because, you know, over time the transfer came off and, you know, the nice pictures on it, which was pretty blue with these, you know, uh, horses and nice scenes, but over time it would have gone. It would have lasted like five times in the dishwasher and then it would have been ruined. So um, I put it up in the top part of our shed and it stayed there for 14 years until I moved. I, I wasn't ready to part with it. Um, so it isn't like we're saying to you that we have the magic that nothing bothers us. And, you know, we're not like other humans where it's hard. It is, you know, it really, really is. But once you've gone through it and you've got a little bit of distance, um, what you tend to find is that your parents would not want you stressing. I mean, your parents love you. They don't want you to go through this. They don't want to be the thing where it's already hard enough to deal with the passing to then also have all the guilt over the stuff. So in some ways you have to sort of cut yourself a little bit of slack there. We're here to hold your hand. Really, yeah. that, that's, the, that's the message. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Marie, thanks, always great to see you. Thank you, you too. <laughs> it was helpful, take care. Mm -hmm.